Hi everyone, welcome to church this morning. Well, as you know, it's Valentine's Day, and whilst it's beautiful to celebrate the love between humans, isn't it amazing that we get to celebrate the love of our Heavenly Father, who created the universe, the one true God? In Romans 5 verse 5, it says, The love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. As we meditate on this truth and receive it as true for ourselves, that same love rises up as a fountain of living water overflowing into the lives of all who come in contact with us. Freely we have received, freely give. There is no self-effort involved in this process. Remember, we are receivers, not achievers. So join me today in celebrating the greatest love ever given and joyfully expect the overflow to bless others through you this week. So God bless you and have a great day.
face outshines the brightest sun. Jesus, you're glorious. You are so glorious. With eyes that blaze like burning fire. Jesus, you're glorious. You are so glorious. His view and opinion, 
his view and opinion this is his glory in us his view and opinion his view and opinion this is his glory in us my life is on display my life is on display my life is on display in them I am glorified in them I am glorified in them I am glorified in them King of glory have your glory 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 now have your glory now have your glory now have your glory now your view and opinion your view This is his glory in us. Well, good morning, and perhaps by the time you watch this message, it may already be snowing where you are. Um, I wanted to do this video outside. I love getting out, but when I woke this morning and I could feel that the temperatures had plummeted and I could hear the wind rising, and then I looked out the window and I thought, you know what? This flower in the wall doesn't look too bad after all. I bet there's a lot of people would love to see this again. So I know we're supposed to suffer for the gospel, but maybe next week we'll get out, okay? So if you've been listening and watching over the last few weeks, you will know that we have been on the subject of how wonderful and supernatural and timeless the gospel is and how the Holy Spirit is the one who comes to open our eyes more and more to the glory of the gospel, which reveals the beauty of God, his Father's heart for us. Now, that revelation of who God is, it's of course right throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Everything points to Christ and how the Son would reveal the Father. But there was a gradual unfolding of that. We could say it was a bit like the dawn as the sun rises in the sky. At first, there are only a few glints of the glory to come. But as the sun rises in his full glory, the earth is filled with light. And so too in the Old Testament, we see shafts of light piercing the darkness, speaking of a glory to come. But it's not until the New Testament with the appearing of Jesus that we see the great light dawning. In the words of Matthew, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death cast its shadow, a light has shone. Now we're living in a land right now where death is casting a long shadow. And I trust that today still, you will know just listening to this message, the power of the illumination of the Holy Spirit to bring light into your darkness. So just, you know, as the first rays of light falling on our eyes in the morning, wake us up. Throughout the Old Testament, we begin to see the Holy Spirit wakening men and women to the reality of a God who wants to commune with them, to share his life with them, and whose covenants with them both reveal that desire and point to the ultimate fulfillment of that desire, Jesus Christ. And so again this morning, I want to show you the glory of this gospel breaking through time, breaking through the darkness of one individual's life to awaken him to the reality of God's heart for him, despite all that he has done. So we're going to read this account in Genesis 28 of Jacob having a dream. 
that results in him beginning to wake up to the reality of God's hand on his life. And I'm just trusting that as we read this together this morning, that each of us too will begin to awaken more and more to the reality of God's hand on our lives today through Christ. This is Genesis 28 from verse 10. It says, Jacob departed from Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he came to a certain place and he spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones in that place and he laid it under his head, as it were, and lay down in that place. And he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood before it and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And so Jacob arose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and he set it up as a pillar, and he poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, which means literally the house of God. Now Jacob's name actually literally means twister or usurper or schemer. And what a picture that is of how he began his life. If you remember the story, here he is on the run from the anger of his brother Esau, having schemed his way to grasping the blessings of his father Isaac. Now, we often say of people, ah, he's been like that since day one. Well, you know, in the case of Jacob, that was literally true. The Bible tells us that he was actually born grasping his twin brother Esau's heel. He then grew up always on his brother's heels, always looking to overtake him until that grasping to be first, to be blessed, left him here all alone, separated from his brother, his family, his friends, trying to save himself on his own. And that is Jacob's story and your story and my story and the story of every man and woman before the revelation of the Holy Spirit, before we awaken to see how much God is for us, we can only spend our lives grasping for life, trying to save ourselves on our own. Now, as we read of Jacob's dream, we see here a picture of a man awakening to the reality of covenant, that God was with him. Jacob used another term, awakening at heaven's gate. What a beautiful, what a beautiful revelation that is. And what I want to show you this morning is that if what Jesus said was true, that the least Christian under the, new, under the new covenant of grace is greater than the greatest old covenant believer, then if Jacob, on awakening to the presence of God with him, was able to say, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Well, how much more should we, the church, the body of Christ, be able to say that about our lives this morning? In Christ... Should we not be as people awakened by the Holy Spirit to where we are, hidden with Christ and God, no longer mere men, but the very temple of the Holy Spirit? I mean, looking this morning at the life we now share together as the church, as the Spirit-filled body of Christ, should we not be able to exclaim before this world, look how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. As long as the church remains asleep to who they now are, as long as we cannot say this is none other than the house of God, then we will always be putting off into some future day the reality of the communion with God's Spirit that is ours today. Let me put that a different way. Without a revelation that we are the habitation of God, we will always be waiting for a visitation from God. When you cannot see what God has done, you will spend your life grasping for something better. Here's the gospel. There is nothing better than Christ in you, the hope of glory. To see 
that we have already been blessed in the spiritual realm with every spiritual blessing in Christ brings an end to grasping and entering into the rest of being whom God has made us to be, sons of God and co-heirs with Christ. You know, Jacob means grasper, supplanter. And we know that later in his life, you know, he did begin to see further to see what God saw. He began to see past his past and he began to see his eternal calling, the name God had purposed for him from before the foundation of the world. And what a beautiful name, Israel, which means Prince with God. What a beautiful picture that is of life in Christ. A prince is the son of a king and prince with God describes the life of every believer in Christ heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Now Jacob, he grasped the heel of Esau as he was being born. He was born a grasper. And you know, in Adam, we are all born graspers. Yet as believers, all our grasping and scheming are unnecessary. For because of God's covenant with us in Christ, we have already been given all we need. In the words of Paul to the grasping Corinthians, all things belong to you, whether the world or life or death or things past or present or future, all belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. That's 1 Corinthians 3, 22 and 23. Isn't that beautiful? But you know, we each need to know that for ourselves. Each of us need to receive and grow in that revelation of our shared life in Christ. And that revelation brings our grasping to an end. We enter into rest, his rest over us. Jesus said that eternal life was knowing God and to know him is to know that he is at rest. As Paul said to the Colossians, when you set your eyes on heavenly things, you see that Christ has sat down. He is at rest in his finished work. Now that rest was manifested in the life of Jesus. What a beautiful revelation he was of the father at rest. In the passage we read this morning, uh, Jacob is actually asleep in the silence of the desert, but Jesus, he lay his head down and slept in a sinking boat in the middle of a violent storm at sea. Jesus himself was the ultimate perfect revelation, manifestation of man totally at rest, totally secure in the love of the Father, a Father at rest. For when we see Jesus, we see the Father. As a result, you know, there is no recorded incident anywhere of Jesus saying or doing anything to gain the approval of men. Quite the opposite. His utter confidence and peace totally unnerved his opponents. He was a man who never once grasped for the approval of men and who, when facing death, faced it down as a lesser opponent. Isn't that amazing? I mean, Jesus certainly totally unnerved Pontius Pilate, if you remember, by simply not grasping for life but keeping his peace. Do you know the greatest act of spiritual warfare you can engage in is not jumping up and down shouting at the devil. It is to soak yourself in the truth of your acceptance in Christ and then stand before every accusation and rejection in this world and stand as the accepted in the beloved and just continue to stand in the peace of God. You know, Pontius Pilate had seen many condemned men stand before him and he watched each of them grasp for life, fight their corner, plead for their lives when they realized that his decision was the only thing between them and death. Yet Jesus never said a word. In the end, it was Pilate who cried out, are you not speaking to me? Why not? I mean, do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? And it was then for the first time that Jesus spoke, but only to speak of his father and tell Pilate that whatever power he had, had been given to him from above. Jesus, right to the end, did not grasp for life, for he knew who he was. He said of himself, the Son of Man has come to give his life as a ransom for many. The first Adam, in grasping for life, lost it. But where the first Adam, and all born of him like Jacob, grasped for life, the last Adam, Jesus, the Bible tells us was a life-giving and is a life-giving spirit, not a life-grasping spirit. And all who are born of him and who live in the power of his life-giving spirit, our lives too are transformed from graspers to givers. Now what I think is interesting in this passage is that this revelation of God's blessing on his life comes when Jacob is asleep, asleep when he is at rest. 
He has this dream while he's asleep, while his head is on the rock. And so often in Scripture, God, we see him carrying out his purposes, not when men have striven to reach some height of effort, but when they've got to the end of themselves and are at rest. Rest brings revelation. For the truth that God reveals to us is that he is a God at rest, for his work is complete. So again and again in Scripture, we see this pattern of God working in people's lives when they're powerless to help themselves. Remember, it was while Adam slept that Eve was formed. It was while Abraham slept that God cut a covenant with him. It was while Elijah lay exhausted and powerless to go on that an angel was sent to minister to him. And even Jesus spoke of the prodigal son reaching the end of himself before he remembered his father. I wonder right now across the world how many people have just come to the end of themselves in trying. You know, the right time for God to move in our life is not the time of our strength, but the time of our weakness. Don't be afraid when you appear powerless to change things. For God, that is often just the right time. God did his best work when you and I were powerless. He still does. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's Romans 5 verse 8. So the Lord was in effect saying to Jacob, Get to the end of your scheming. Stop grasping. But you know, throughout his life, Jacob was prone to grasping. Even later in life, remember when he wrestled all night with the angel, he wouldn't stop grasping for the blessing of God. On that occasion, all night Jacob's cry was, I won't let go of you until you bless me. It was then that the Lord finally gave him that beautiful name, Prince with God, Israel. It was as if God was saying to Jacob, What I believe his Holy Spirit would say to us, covenant means you can stop grasping for what I freely give you. Covenant means you can stop grasping for what I freely give you. Now, why is it so important that we stop grasping? Well, think of how much grasping in life for the acceptance and the approval of people has driven competition and division in our communities and families. In the same way that grasping for the approval of men causes hurt and division, so also does grasping for the blessings of God. After all, was that not what drove the religious leaders to crucify Jesus? They were grasping for the approval of God. Now, what's the best way to deal with somebody who's grasping? I remember some years ago looking this up, thinking about how does a lifeguard deal with someone who is in danger of pulling them down too because they're flailing about and grasping for life so violently. So I looked it up once with our friend Mr. Google to see what he would say about the best way to save such a person. And this is what was written. It said, to save such a victim from themselves, it's best to approach them from behind and use your arms to pin their arms back. In other words, you have to approach them on their blind side. How often do you think the Lord has found you or I thrashing and grasping and flailing about, demanding that he rescue us from some situation? And how often have we found that he blindsides us? When all our energy to hold on, to grasp for what we want is gone, as we finally quieten down, we discover that there are two strong arms outstretched and they're holding us up and will never let us go. You have been hidden in Christ Believer, stop struggling, stop splashing and thrashing about. He has saved you. He is saving you and he will save you. Our job, let him, let him be your savior. That's what discipleship is all about. You've confessed Jesus as your Lord and savior. Now let the Holy Spirit teach you how to let him be your savior. Be still and know that Christ is a wonderful savior. So this image of Jacob lying down for the night and resting his head on a rock is a wonderful picture of resting in Christ and the revelation that comes with rest. Jacob sets his head on a rock. Now, who is our rock? Set your mind on Christ. Rest brings revelation, and the greatest revelation is the person of God, and he is a God at rest. Now, in this scripture, we see in verse 12 a wonderful picture of Christ and his work A mystery, you could say, hidden from ages past that even the patriarchs like Jacob never really quite understood. And that mystery really was given to Jacob as a picture of a ladder. If we see that in verse 12, it says he had a dream and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. 
and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Now, the ladder appears to join earth and heaven, to bring God and man together. That is a picture of the person and the work of Christ, a picture of union with God. One end of this ladder reaches all the way to earth. It does not fall short, and the other end reaches to God himself. God the Father, through Christ the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit, has made a way for you and I to be one with him, to be joined with him. And Jesus Christ is that way. From the incarnation at one end, where God became man, to the ascension on the other, when the last Adam, the Son of Man and the Son of God, arrived in the throne room. This ladder reaches all the way on both ends. It doesn't fall short. In Christ, you have not fallen short of union with God. Now note, it doesn't say that a ladder was sent down from heaven. The wording there is that it was set up on the earth. Now it's true that Christ was sent down from heaven to bring us to the Father, but I felt that this phrase, a ladder was set up on the earth, was speaking of the birth and the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, all which took place on the earth. Now the Hebrew word there for set up means to take one's stand or station, to establish oneself as stationed somewhere. What an amazing picture of the gospel. In Christ, God was establishing himself, taking up his position, identifying totally with man and saying, here I stand. God in Christ literally came and stood for you and I. You know, Christ stood for us under the law and totally fulfilled the law on our behalf. He stood for us at the cross and totally took the penalty of sin onto himself. He stood for us in death, dying and being buried for us. And he stood for us in his resurrection and ascension, for we have been raised in him. Now that truth of how God totally identifies with us, that is, that is so beautiful. You know, it melts the hardest heart. And I remember a few years ago hearing a story that was a beautiful picture of how you can identify with someone in such a beautiful way, you know. There was a story in the press back in 2007 of a father who brought his young son to the world-renowned Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge for cancer treatment. Now, the father decided to turn this difficult journey into something more memorable by booking himself and his son into a top-class hotel for a few days before the treatment. And the night before the operation, the head waiter noticed that the boy was very anxious and he asked his father about it. And the father explained that the son would have to have his head shaved that night for the operation and was feeling very self-conscious about coming down into the hotel the next day for breakfast without any hair. The head waiter expressed sympathy, but he didn't leave it at that. The next morning, when the father and son came down to breakfast, every member of the hotel restaurant staff had shaved their heads during the night. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, they'd gone to such lengths to identify with that boy in his need. Now, I need to tell you this morning, nobody has gone further in your life or mine to totally identify with us in all our need than Jesus Christ. He took his place in us that we could take our place in him. Into his own body, he took our greatest affliction, our sin, our separation from God. What robs man of the life of God is separation. And through believing the lie of Satan and living out that lie, man became separate from the life of God. In fact, the original lie of Satan to Adam and Eve was the lie or the seed of separation. For Satan spoke that separation over Eve. He, he said, in effect, you're separate from God, but you could get closer to him and be like him in his power if you do what I say. And Eve swallowed that lie. Literally, she bit of the apple because it looked good and it tasted good. And that's like the philosophy, of the, the philosophy of this world. It looks and it sounds great. All the things this world offers you that could bring you closer to God-likeness, which in this world is self-sufficiency. All of those things are made redundant by the cross. For at the cross, God obliterated the distance between him and us. He took the very thing that separated us onto himself our sin, and did away with it. And the Holy Spirit works to awaken believers to the truth and every person indeed that we didn't climb or grasp our way to the very gate of heaven. We were carried there by
by the grace of God. The moment Jesus died, at that time, in that very moment, the Bible says that there was a ripping of the curtain, the veil in the temple from top to bottom, declaring the end of separation between unholy man and a holy God. The cross abolished every man-made philosophy and religion that purports to tell you how you can get closer to God. For in Christ, you can't get any closer to God. You know, when those Roman soldiers nailed Jesus to the cross and then lifted the cross upright so that it fell into a hole in the ground, little did they know that they were lifting up God's ladder to heaven. It was set up on the earth. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. The separation between God and man that man could not overcome, God has overcome. Christ and him crucified for us, buried for us, resurrected for us and ascended for us is our ladder, the new and living way for us to be in union with our Father in heaven and all by grace through faith. And even that faith comes to you as the gift of God's Spirit this morning. The power of God's Spirit is present as you listen this morning. The power for you to discover by the end of this message that somehow, in a way you can't understand in your head, You just know that you know that what I'm telling you about what God has done for you in Christ is true. For in your heart, you can feel a great rest beginning and the power rising to stop grasping and let him be your savior. You know, God spoke to Jacob through a dream about a ladder because Jacob was not able to take in the enormity of what God intended for men. That he always intended not to join us with himself by a ladder, but by the person of his own son. Now, none of the patriarchs or prophets in the Old Testament could see this clearly. I mean, I think the one who got closest was the one who found himself, much to his own surprise, pointing at his own cousin and declaring, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the separation. That was John the Baptist. And that is why I believe Jesus called John the greatest under the Old Covenant. The best picture of our union with God, you see, is not a ladder, but the person of Christ. You know, when I think of a ladder, I do not think of union. I think of something that I have to climb. And the idea of climbing the ladder of success or the ladder of holiness would be what Colossians 2 describes as one of the basic principles of this world, that it is by man's own efforts that he raises himself up. I grew up with the religious idea that there was a series of steps that I had to keep taking to get closer to God. The problem was that the steps never seemed to come to an end. It was like two steps forward, three steps back. Religion gives you the impression that you're getting somewhere, but you will never arrive because that would put religion out of business. Religion gives you the impression that you're getting somewhere, but you'll never arrive because that would put the religion out of business. The problem is that it can take a lifetime to realize that the religious ladder isn't reaching to the top. In fact, it's not reaching anywhere. It's a circle. Do you know what a ladder in a circle looks like? A treadmill. Think of a hamster on a wheel running for hours, but never actually getting anywhere. It just feels to him like he's getting somewhere. You know, for many of us, without a full revelation of the completeness of Christ's work to reconcile us to God, that as Paul told the Corinthians, those who are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him, we never come to the end of our grasping for God. There always appears to be something more we need to do to close the gap between us and the Father. If only I prayed more, gave more, tried more, confessed better, worshipped better, went to more meetings, went to better meetings, went to a better church, then I could get further up this ladder. I could reach communion with God. The ladder I grew up with never went right to the top. Christ is not a list of steps that you have to take. Christ is the one who took all the steps on our behalf from the very first to the very last. He set up this ladder on the earth. He took upon himself our flesh, born as a baby in a field far from home, a stranger in a strange land. He totally identified with our estrangement from God. What a wonderful Savior we have. He took all the steps on our behalf. He was made perfect through everything he suffered on our behalf, not so that we would have to go through the same suffering trying to climb that ladder, not so that we would have to climb the ladder. Christ did not leave us 
a ladder to climb. He carried us on his back and he still bears the scars of our weight on his body. He took us upon himself and into himself and he made a way to the very gate of heaven, to the throne of the Father and invited us to accept him as our ladder, our way. He said of himself, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. There is only one step we have been left to take. Receive Christ as your life. Believe the gospel. Believe that God is so generous that he has done all that is necessary for you to be united with him. Place your head on the rock. Enter your rest and you will see something so good that no religion has ever dreamt of it. No ear has heard, no eye has seen, nor entered the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. You know, the Spirit of the world wants to keep giving us seven steps to getting closer to God. But listen to what the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians. We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that comes from God, that we might know the things that God has freely given to us. You see, that's 1 Corinthians 2.12, by the way. I love that scripture. What has been freely given to us in Christ is nothing less than communion with God. And the Spirit is teaching the church what covenant truly means. Covenant means you can stop grasping for what God has freely given you. If Jacob can awake and cry out, How awesome is this place! There is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Do you not see that the Holy Spirit would move the church to see where we stand in Christ is no less awesome. Can we not see and say by the Spirit about our lives, Behold, the house of God, for we are in Christ, and through him we died and our lives are now hidden with Christ in God. Now, you might think to yourself, there he goes again. Why do you minister each week on the same subject, Christ and our union with him? And I have to tell you because I really feel that religion, the spirit of this world, the belief that you are what you do, has so stripped the church of her strength, the joy of the Lord, that it has become normal now for believers to come to churches everywhere looking for what they already have, the presence of God. I trust in this season when you, even in your home, all by yourself, are discovering that you do not have to go on a pilgrimage to some place to find God. We thank God for gathering together as the body of Christ. I'm looking forward to that, but God wants us each to awaken where we are, to know that in Christ we have communion with God. You know, in medieval times, people used to go on long pilgrimages for various reasons, which all boiled down to one reason, to get closer to God. History records all the amazing lengths people went to to try and get closer to God. Many walked for hundreds of thousands of miles to get to a place that they believed would bring them closer to God. I mean, Ireland is full of such pilgrim trails to holy mountains and the holy wells, and so was Europe. The most famous is that beautiful place in northern Spain, Santiago de Compostela, and thousands of people still walk that walk uh, looking for something. Rome, I guess, was the main center for pilgrimage, and many people walked thousands of miles to get to that place because many of the churches in Rome contained artifacts uh, that had been close to Jesus and people figured, I guess, if I, if I get close to what was close to God, then I'll be closer to him. And so people risked their lives to walk for thousands of miles because without a revelation of the new covenant, Christ in you, then your life will always be driven by a sense of separation from God and you will spend a lifetime grasping for what has already been given. It is said that in one particular church in Rome, there was a plaque on the wall, and on that was written something that you wouldn't really want to read if you just walked a thousand miles to get there. It said, if you came here looking for Christ, if you didn't bring him with you, you won't find him here. Now, before we look down our nose at other people's attempts to get closer to God, can I remind you that God doesn't? He is so gracious and merciful that he meets each one of us on that road like he met the two disciples on the way to Emmaus, walking with us even when we're walking in the wrong direction. It is for each of us to ask ourselves, how close do I really believe I am to God today? Is my life led and directed by the revelation 
of our union with Christ? Or is my life still driven by a sense of separation from God? Is there the sound of rest in my soul or the sound of desperate thrashing and grasping for life? Am I desperately trying to get to where I already am? Does my life to heaven look like a man on a treadmill? You know, as long as we believers do not realize what we have been freely given, where we have been placed in him, we will spend all our lives running on the spot, trying to get to where we already are. Jesus did not say, come to me all those who are weary and I will give you running. He said, I will give you rest. Here is the gospel. Yes, a long pilgrimage was required to get us to God, but Christ is the one who made that pilgrimage on our behalf. He came the longest distance any pilgrim can ever come. He came from divinity to humanity. He came from eternity to enter your life and mine. He set up a ladder on the earth that stretches from the vilest, darkest, most sinful, separate condition of man and stretches right into the very heart of the Father. He didn't stand at the top of some ladder and exhort us to start climbing. The God we worship is the God who came for us, the God who begins where we are at. Isn't that beautiful? And the Holy Spirit is still saying to the church today, wake up to that revelation, church. Be full of this God. Be the life-giving body of Christ. Be him who doesn't shout at the world or shout at the sinner from a distance to exhort them to start climbing some religious ladder. Be him who goes and sits with them where they're at and totally identifies with them and loves them and speaks to them with utter confidence of the love of God. Because to be full of God's Spirit is to see that all that separates them from us is the revelation of Christ by the grace of God. There, but for the grace of God, go I. You know, no matter how many years you have been a believer, no matter how much you may have prayed or worked or sacrificed for God, there is nothing that separates you from the vilest person you know but the grace of God. And that is why only a revelation of the enormity of God's grace will move the church to go and sit with the beggars and teach them the song of the Lord. Rejoice with me, for what has been lost to me has been restored. That's the song of the Good Father. In religion, you'll always be running, but in Christ, you have arrived. The Spirit is saying to the church, wake up and enter your rest. You know, when we awake like Jacob awoke, to the revelation of the enormity of what Christ has done, what covenant truly means, then we too, church, will be able to say of our lives together, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. God bless you.
Well, thanks for watching today. And if you really felt something spoke to you today or touched you, feel free to get in touch. And you can do that by just searching River City Church Ireland on Facebook or on YouTube. And I just really believe that as you're just listening to these messages, that something is changing in your life because the Word of God never returns to Him void. God bless you.